Colossians chapter 1 tonight. This is probably maybe the most used verse, one of at least the most used verses that the Jehovah's Witnesses are going to try to use to convince people of their false doctrines. As you're turning there, let me just remind you, we've been looking at the Jehovah's Witnesses now for some time. We've been, <clears throat> some of us have been getting mail, letters in the mail, and uh, we're exposing falsehood as well as building ourselves up in the faith. We spent some time looking at who the Jehovah's Witnesses are. We are right now looking at their teachings. We looked somewhat briefly on the Trinity last time we met together, and I was here teaching. We looked at some of the history of uh, what early church had to say about the worship of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the deity of Christ. And we began to look at the person of Christ, and we almost finished with what we're going to look at as far as who Jesus is, except this verse in this section here. Chapter 1 of Colossians, verse 15 is the verse. Let's read it together tonight. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The firstborn of all creation. And what you find is the Jehovah's Witnesses want to take that. They want to say, well, here you have it right before us in plain English that Jesus Christ is the firstborn of all creation. What that means is He's the first creation. He's the first made, the firstborn of all creation. God made Him first in all of creation. So that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and other, I'm sure, heretical groups want us to believe about Jesus. And let's just be honest here at the very beginning. Let's just pretend we didn't have a Bible. Let's pretend that we have just a little piece of paper and that's all that God gave us. And all that God gave us was verse 15 of Colossians chapter 1. If that was the only thing that we had, we might be tempted to believe that. I mean, let's just be honest. As we look at this verse, we read it, pretend that's the only thing we knew about God. As a friend of mine talked about how if this was the only verse in the Bible, well... Maybe we would believe that. So, one thing as Christians, what we always try to do is to be seekers after the truth. We want to know the truth, even if it hurts us, even if it stings us, even if it contradicts what we believe, we want the truth. So let's start there. If this was the only verse in the Bible, perhaps that's what it meant. Thankfully, this is not the only verse in the Bible. And it's not the only verse in Colossians. Look down in verse 16. For by Him, by whom? By Jesus. For by Him all things were created. Normally speaking, what would we take from that? We would take probably Jesus was not created because He created all things. Not everything, but one, but all things both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. Verse 17 then says this, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And then if you look in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, look what it says about Christ there in verse 9. For in Him, in Jesus, for in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So we see very plainly, just by reading a few verses in this section of Colossians, that Paul is not saying that Jesus is the first created. The question then becomes, what is he saying? Well, if you look at verse 15, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The big question there is, what does firstborn mean? If you look in verse 18, the word firstborn is used, but speaking about probably a different context, 
It says he is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn from the dead means Jesus was the first resurrected. So if you look back in verse 15, could verse 15, when it says firstborn, could that be looking at the fact that he's firstborn of the dead? It could be. But what I think verse 15 is talking about is that Jesus Christ is firstborn or He has the preeminence over creation. Um, it's not as much, at least in our day and time, it's not as much a big deal today, but especially in the times of the Bible, if you were the firstborn, what did that mean for you? If you had the title firstborn, what did that mean? I'm sorry? It, he was, in a sense, above the other siblings in some sense. He had the preeminence. And you see this in Psalm 89. Psalm 89. This is a great help, I think, in understanding what Colossians 1.15 is actually saying to us. This is speaking of King David. King David, Psalm 89, and look at what it says in verse 27. Psalm 89, verse 27. I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Now, was King David the first king of Israel? No, King Saul or King uh, Saul was. Was King David the firstborn in his family? He's actually the youngest in his family. So what you see here is not that David was the first king, not that he was even firstborn in his family, but God says, "I also shall make him my firstborn." What that means is David is going to be above all the kings. He has the preeminence. Then it says, the highest of the kings of the earth. So King David is firstborn. He's above the other kings of the earth, though he was not physically firstborn. God exalted him. And what you see here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, I believe is, is the Lord saying to us, Jesus Christ, I have exalted him. He is firstborn. He's above all creation. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? When you read verse 16 and 17, you see that He created all of creation. He has preeminence. So that's probably the big verse, or one of them, that the Jehovah's Witnesses go to. Now, before we go on, we're going to look at the work of Christ. Does anybody have any questions about um, the biblical view of who Jesus is or the way the Jehovah's Witnesses view Jesus? Are there any questions on that? Okay, so let's talk about the ransom. Somebody tell me what a ransom is. When something is paid to set someone free, to set you free. So when you read or talk to a Jehovah's Witness, they'll talk about the ransom. Christ as our ransom. And that sounds biblical, doesn't it? He is our ransom. But like we've seen now a number of times... When Jehovah's Witnesses and cults use the same language we use, oftentimes it means something quite different than what we use. So when you read maybe about the Jehovah's Witnesses and they use the term ransom, it doesn't mean what we mean. Uh, if someone, if a Jehovah's Witness is talking to you and they use the term, they say, you know what, we're saved by the ransom of Christ. They mean something different than what we mean by that. So I'm going to read a pretty long passage here from their literature to you and try to pay close attention and see if, if you can tell what is off in what they say. Um, I've taken this, the Scripture references out just to make it easier to read. But I want you to listen to what they say about the ransom of Jesus. Since a perfect human life was lost... 
No imperfect human life could ever buy it back. What was needed was a ransom equal in value to what was lost. This is in harmony with the principle of perfect justice found in God's Word, which says, soul will be for soul. So, what would cover the value of the perfect human soul or life that Adam lost? Another perfect human life was the corresponding ransom that was required. So they say Adam sinned, he, he, he lost his place, we may say. Therefore, how, does, how do we reclaim that? We have to have one that's a corresponding ransom to Adam. We need another person to live a perfect life. Let me read some more. How could one man serve as a ransom for many? In fact, millions of humans? Well... How did humans numbering into the millions come to be sinners in the first place? Recall that by sinning, Adam lost the precious possession of perfect human life. Hence, he could not pass it on to his offspring. Instead, he could pass on only sin and death. Jesus, whom the Bible calls the last Adam, had a perfect human life and he never sinned. In a sense, Jesus stepped into Adam's place in order to save us. By sacrificing or giving up His perfect life in flawless obedience to God, Jesus paid the price for Adam's sin. Jesus thus brought hope to Adam's offspring. Now, a lot of that will sound very similar to what we believe, of course. But can anyone pick up from that or from the other teachings we've looked at so far, pick up what is missing here when the Jehovah's Witnesses explain the ransom of Christ? That's a huge point, and they certainly are. He's just another creature. Jesus is. He's, he's high. He's mighty. He's the first created. But, uh, what did we need? Because of Adam's transgression, we just needed someone equal to Adam. That's all we needed. That's, that's real. That's one of the big things. Anybody else see anything? Well, let me say two things about that. As already has been pointed out, if Adam sinned, and Jesus is just simply a corresponding sacrifice, he's equal with Adam, then how can Jesus save more than one person? I mean, I could see Adam being saved because Jesus died for him, but if Jesus was just equal with Adam, then how can he save anybody else besides Adam? If one man sinned, and then this other man came and lived perfectly and died for this one man, this one man could go free, but what about us? And, and this is another big thing. Yes, sin was passed down through Adam to the human race. He was our representative. But when you think about where we're at today, not only has sin been passed down to us, we have sinned, haven't we? We have sinned. So if, if Jesus is only equal with Adam, that means Jesus can take away the sins of Adam. What about our sins, though? What that means for us is there's no hope for us in the Jehovah's Witness system. To put it another way, say Adam lost $100. And then another man came in and said, I'll give you $100. Well, that $100 can make up for Adam's $100. But what about the $100 I've lost, and you lost, and your family's lost, and your descendants are going to lose? What we need is something much more valuable than Adam. We need the Son of God coming and dying for us. That's what we need. We need Jesus Christ coming and not simply dying in the place of Adam, but dying for my sin. What's going to happen to my sin? And we're going to see more of that in just a moment. Um, let me read maybe two more quotes, and then we're going to look at some Scripture. Jehovah's Witnesses say this, 
However, why did Jesus have to suffer and die in the painful way that was described in the Gospels? By subjecting Himself to the extreme test and remaining faithful, Jesus refuted once and for all the devil's claim that humans would not remain loyal to God when under trial. Is that all He did? To be fair, they would say more, I think. But here's what they say later. He thus proved that Adam too could have obeyed God if he had chosen to do so. By enduring under trial, Jesus left us a model to follow. Well, he does leave us a model, doesn't he? But thankfully, he leaves us much more. He dies so he can take our sins upon him and we can be saved. So when you, when you hear a Jehovah's Witness talking about ransom, they're talking about something far different than what we say. Let's look at a couple places here in the Bible. Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53 speaks in terms foreign to the Jehovah's Witnesses. It speaks about what really Jesus' ransom was about. It wasn't just simply, though this is wonderful, He did die in Adam's place in one sense, but He died in all of our places. Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6, But He was pierced through for our transgressions, not just in the place of Adam, but for our sins, our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our, for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. Now listen to verse 6. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. That's a ransom. He died for our sins so we could be saved. And let me turn to 2 Corinthians now. I have some more Scripture. Let's just turn to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, verse 21, one of the most famous passages about what happened when Jesus died in all the Bible. Verse 21, He made Him, that first He there is speaking of God the Father, He made Him, Him being Jesus, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That's what happened. He wasn't just simply setting us an example. He was dying for our sins. All the sins, every single sin that you will ever commit in your whole life from when you were just young to the day you die, every single sin Jesus suffered for, for you and for every single soul who has ever lived. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Okay? So His ransom was actually dying for sinners, for their sin. It's much different than Jehovah's Witnesses. Any comments on the ransom? Well, let's look at now personal salvation. How are the Jehovah's Witnesses and their theology, how are they saved? And... It, and looking on their website, looking at some of their literature, what you see is Jehovah's Witnesses try to stress the fact that they're not saved by works. They even have an article about, do you, do we knock on doors to win our salvation? And they say, well, of course not. We don't do that. We were saved by grace. But if you read the article, uh, you begin to see that even in that article, they're denying salvation by grace, as we're going to see very plainly here in a few minutes. So when you think of the Jehovah's Witnesses, though they will try to say, oh, we're saved by God's grace, nobody could ever work their way to heaven. Their religion is very much based on works. They very much believe that they can work their way to heaven. Uh, that is in their system. So how can anyone be saved? Here, I want you to listen, listen to this. Here is what part of their literature says. Water baptism is a requirement for all who want to have a relationship with Jehovah God. And they go on and say this, To qualify for baptism, however, you must take definite 
steps. So to be baptized in the, as a Jehovah's Witness is a requirement for everyone who's going to have a relationship with God. But before you're even baptized, there's certain steps one has to take on that road. What's the steps here? First of all, it's knowledge. And it's not just simply knowledge as if, yes, we must learn. Obviously, if we're going to believe in Jesus, we have to know who He is. We have to know, uh, understand our sin. So all of us have to have knowledge before we're saved. But their knowledge, their view of knowledge goes beyond this. You really need to attend meetings. You need to really gain some more knowledge before you're converted. And then from knowledge, they go to faith. And really, in the Jehovah's Witness system, it doesn't appear they put much focus on faith. Uh, it's just kind of a, a given. It's just kind of a thing. Yeah, you're supposed to do that. It's important. The stress is not at all on faith in the Jehovah's Witness system. After faith, you've got knowledge, you've got faith, and then share the Bible with other people. Door knocking, evangelizing and things. This is a requirement for salvation. Now, I want you to listen to what some of their literature says about this. <clears throat> Having begun to make his mind over through study and application of God's Word to his life, and by means of godly companionship. Now listen to this. The seeker after salvation. This is the seeker after salvation. The one who's seeking to be saved. The seeker after salvation next needs to turn his attention to the service commanded by Christ Jesus. So if you're seeking after salvation as a Jehovah's Witness, you've got to go spread the word. That's part of seeking after salvation. I cut that quote off, but listen to the rest of this other one. Participation in preaching and teaching God's Word is vitally related to your salvation. Now, if anybody who's going to be watching or listen, listening to this later, that is from something called What is Needed for Salvation from 1967. That's on their website still. So if you're seeking after salvation, you have to be seeking to spread the gospel, their gospel. If you're seeking after salvation as well, you need to understand that participation in preaching and teaching God's Word is vitally related to your salvation. So what we see clearly from these quotes is the Jehovah's Witnesses, though their words may deny it, it's very clear in their literature they do not believe in salvation by grace or faith. They believe in salvation by works. Here's the thing, though. The requirements don't end there. Not only as a Jehovah's Witness must you have knowledge, must you have faith, must you share uh, the message of the Bible as they understand it. You have to have repentance. You have to have conversion, turning around. You have to have personal dedication. And then, baptism. Here's a question. How long does it take to get saved as a Jehovah's Witness? How many, how many years does it take, maybe, to become a Christian in their understanding? It's so different than the Bible. You have the Philippian jailer. He hears the message that night. He fall, comes in, falls down on his knees after the earthquake and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas speak to him. He's, he's converted and saved. And later that night, he's baptized. You have the thief on the cross. He's insulting Jesus. And yet at some point on the cross, after he's insulted Jesus, this thief turns his heart to him and Jesus forgives him and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's New Testament Christianity. That's not Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that they are saved by works in actuality and not by faith, not by faith, not by grace. And here's, here's the bad thing, if that's not bad enough. The requirements don't end after baptism for Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, they do talk about some other things like continuing in the faith. And in one sense, obviously, we believe you have to continue to the end. But Judgment Day then. Now, can anybody tell me very, very briefly what is the view of Judgment Day to the Jehovah's Witnesses?
Judgment Day to the Jehovah's Witnesses is not as we view it, as the Bible views it, as we're being judged for what we've done on earth in our life. Judgment Day for the Jehovah's Witnesses is after death. Now you have a thousand years. Judgment Day is a thousand years. And what you did on earth in the life that you had before you died doesn't matter anymore. All that matters in Judgment Day is how you live those new thousand years. That's Judgment Day to the Jehovah's Witnesses. I want you to listen to a quote from their literature. <clears throat> to live forever, both Armageddon survivors and resurrected ones will have to obey God's commandments, including whatever new requirements Jehovah might reveal during the thousand years. Thus, individuals will be judged on the basis of what they do during Judgment Day. Talk about being wore out. I mean, can you imagine living your life like this? Even if you die in, in faith, let's say, let's put it that way, even if you die in faith, when you, when you come back to life and it's judgment day for a thousand years, you still don't know if you're going to make it. Because my understanding is at least in that thousand years of judgment day, if you don't live the way you should, you can still be annihilated. How would you like to live under that? How would you like to live? Have I done enough? Well, have I knocked on enough doors? Am I going to, am I going to live well enough at, at, at the judgment day for a thousand years? How would you like to live under that? And how do we know that Jehovah's Witnesses are really a religion of works? And if there's a Jehovah's Witness that ever hears this or watches this, I hope they listen very carefully to this point. How, how do we know that the Jehovah's Witnesses are not a group built on grace. And it's this, in part, you can never know if you're really going to be saved. There's no assurance. How could there be? I mean, if you have to do all this and then you have to live a certain way for a thousand years at Judgment Day, how could you ever know whether you really are going to be saved one day? There's no assurance. And I'm going to speak... I hope to in a few minutes about how to witness to a Jehovah's Witness. But one of the big things is talk to them about what the Bible says about assurance of salvation. We can know we're saved. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 plainly tells us, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. We can know we're saved. We don't have to live our whole life guessing. We don't have to live our whole life saying, I just don't know. Maybe I won't do enough good things. Because Christianity is not based on if we do enough good things. Christianity is based on God's grace and Christ dying for us. There's no assurance in the Jehovah's Witness understanding there's no real grace. There's no justification. What is justification? Justification is when God, based on Christ and us being united to Him by faith, justification is when God declares His people right before Him. You see, the moment you became a Christian, whenever that was, the moment you became a Christian, that moment, God said you were 100% right with Him. You see, sanctification is, is how we become more and more like Jesus. Sanctification looks like this. It gets, we grow and grow and grow. That's sanctification. All of us are, want to grow more and more like Jesus. We all want that. However, justification is the moment you're converted, God declares you to be right before Him. Justification is like this. You're not a Christian. You are a Christian. And justification never changes. We're always right with God based on faith in the Son of God. How, you see, our assurance, part of how we know we're a Christian certainly is how we live. First John is all, is so much of First John about that. We have, how do we know we've come to know Him? Because we obey His commandments. How do we know that we've passed from death to life? Because we love the brothers. Obviously, the way we live is a huge thing, but here's the difference. 
We try to live right because God has already saved us. That should be our motivation. We are saved, therefore we want to do what's right. We want to serve God. The Jehovah's Witnesses and other groups, they try to do all these good things so that they can be saved. The Christian says, no, God has already saved me, therefore I want to do good things. And all of us, including myself, need to grow in that understanding. But that is the biblical understanding. If you're a Christian tonight, God has accepted you. And... Yes, if we have sin in our life, we most certainly need to repent of any sin. We know that. We need to give our heart and our lives unreservedly to God. We know that. If you're a Christian tonight, your sins are gone. That's the difference. Christ has really taken our sins and really died for us and taken our sins away. For the Jehovah's Witness, that doesn't happen. That's why they never know if they're saved or not for sure. And it's very sad. And Jehovah's Witnesses need to know that there is real forgiveness with the real God. There is real mercy and grace with the real Jesus. There is real forgiveness and righteousness and assurance and grace with the true gospel. They need to know that. They need to hear that. Let me give you one example. At least is from Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. What does Paul say? Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Here is Paul. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisee he talks about. He had done so much good He had tried to keep the law. He was very strict. And let me actually go back to verse 8 and read it first. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Now listen to verse 9 and may be found in Him, in Christ Jesus, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses do. They try to work. They try to do enough good things. They die, and on Judgment Day, the way they view it, a thousand years, what do they try to do? They try to live according to God. And hopefully, they'll get to live on earth forever one day. Or if they're part of the 144,000, live in heaven forever one day. Here's what Paul says though. And may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That's it. That's it. John Bunyan was going through his life one day and he was struggling with his assurance of salvation and he just didn't know if he was saved or not. All of a sudden, this thought came to him. My righteousness is in heaven. It's in heaven. What do you mean by that? Jesus is in heaven. His faith by God's grace was in Jesus. His righteousness is there. God accepted him in Jesus as righteous. That's how we're saved. So it's very sad, but the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, whether they confess it or not, they believe in salvation by works. And uh, obviously we don't want to be sucked in. We can try to help somebody and be sucked right into their falsehood, can't we? we got to be careful. But we want to help these people. We want to try to help these people. See the light. See the truth that they can be saved by grace. They don't have to work their bodies to a bone. They can be saved by believing in Jesus. They can be saved by grace. And that same grace that saves us is the same grace that changes our life. But we are saved before our life is changed. So how do we witness to a Jehovah's Witness? How do we witness to a Jehovah's Witness? I certainly don't want to make it too complicated. Because you witness to a Jehovah's Witness just like you witness to anybody else. Um, 
A missionary once was asked, you know, how do you, how do you witness to a, I forget the words or the word that was used, but how do you witness to somebody out in a jungle? How do you do that? And he said, you witness to them just like they're a man. Because that's what they are. Our problems are all the same. We have all sinned against God. We are all guilty before God, the righteous judge. And He would be righteous to send us to hell because of our sins. However, this righteous judge is also loving and He's made a way for us to return to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. So, we don't have to complicate it. The way we witness to Jehovah's Witnesses is just the way we witness to anybody. We talk about the gospel, we talk about grace, we talk about justification, we talk about forgiveness, we talk about assurance. And yet, there's some specifics though I think that would help us. One thing is probably when, when somebody's trying to witness to a Jehovah's Witness, and honestly this has been the majority of what I've done, but maybe it's not the best to jump straight in to speaking to them about the Trinity. That's what they may expect. That's what they come ready to do. Is, is they've got a bunch of false teaching memorized about the Trinity and they're ready for what you're going to say maybe and they're ready for what they're going to say. They're ready for that. Now, with that said, let me just remind you of this one great verse that helps our souls but also can help us be a witness about Jesus is John chapter 20, verse 28. This is a reference that really we should probably have memorized in our head because this will really help us uh, protect our own soul, but as well help Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons as well. And it's that passage about Thomas and what he said to Jesus. John chapter 20, verse 28. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Literally, it says, if I remember right in the Greek, it says, the Lord of me and the God of me. Very plainly, Thomas calls Jesus God and Lord. The Lord, the God there. Okay? So that's a verse that we can have, that we can try to help Jehovah's Witnesses. We may say to them, you know what? If I showed you in the Bible, because they're talking about the article, the word the, if I can show you in the Bible where it says Jesus is the God, would that help you? Because in John chapter 20, verse 28, it says just that. Anyway. However, this is something, and this is from um, David A. Reed. This is where I saw this at. It's actually in the Evidence Bible. Any of you ever heard of the Evidence Bible? Ray Comfort, the evangelist, put that out some years ago. and It's, it's a really good Bible. So this man, he, he takes the approach, and he's a former Jehovah's Witness elder. So he's a Christian now, but he used to be an elder. He used to be a Jehovah's Witness elder. He talks about how it can be good uh, at least to begin not at the Trinity exactly at that specific point, but to begin by just saying something like this, you know, now... And I'm putting it in my own words now, but you may say, now I know you're a Jehovah's Witness, and I know Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is an angel. Can you show me in the Bible where it says he's an angel? Or can you show me in the Bible where it says Jesus is Michael, the archangel? Because they believe that Jesus is Michael, the Jehovah's Witnesses do. And you can ask them that. And they can look through their Bibles all day, but it will never tell them that Michael is the same as Jesus, and Jesus is the same as Michael. Um, you may have some passages like in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I believe it is, about when Christ comes back, the voice of an archangel. Remember that? Well, it never says that's Jesus' voice necessarily. And it never says that Jesus is an archangel. It just says an archangel's voice. Look in Jude 9. Let me show you two verses that this man I mentioned brought up. It's very helpful. <clears throat> <clears throat> Jude 9 talks about Michael the archangel. And look how Michael deals with the devil here. This is very important. Let me actually start in verse 8, give us a little context. 
It says, Yet in the same way these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. Now verse 9. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So here is Michael the archangel, perhaps the most powerful angel in existence. And he will not, the Bible says, it says, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So here is Michael. He's not bringing up a railing judgment to the devil. He's not going to do that. Makes me think about how some Christians talk about how we should just talk to the devil and just tell him what to do and all that. Here's an archangel that says, no, I'm not going to do that. The Lord rebuke you. I bring that up, and that man brought this up, to see the contrast between Michael the archangel here and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. What does Jesus say to the devil? He says something quite different than Michael does. And why is that? It's because Michael, though he is a powerful angel, he's an archangel, Jesus is God in the flesh. Verse 10 of chapter 4 of Matthew. Then Jesus said to him, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. What does Jesus say to the devil? He says, Go. He tells him what to do. Michael the archangel wouldn't do that. Jesus, God in the flesh, does do that though. He tells him to go. So what we see here is Jesus is not an angel. Jesus is not Michael the archangel. And that can be a good way to get in, this man was talking about, a good way to, to help uh, the Jehovah's Witness begin to see that this doctrine of Jesus being Michael and Michael the archangel being Jesus is not in the Bible. And that may help them begin to be more open about the Trinity. So that's one way to look at it. Another big way is to stress to a Jehovah's Witness. You may ask them, well, how are you saved? And they say, well, the ransom of Jesus. And you may say to them, but did Jesus die for your sins? We know that He, in your, in your thinking, He died in the place of Adam. But what about your sins? What's going to happen to your sins? And here's a big one, I, t I think, as well. I've already mentioned it but is assurance. To stress, to stress the fact that Christians have assurance of salvation. That wouldn't you love to have, wouldn't you love to be assured that you're going to be saved one day? Wouldn't you love to know that? And who wouldn't want to know that? And the Bible, rightly understood, gives us that assurance. We can know that we're going to be saved one day. And we can say to the Jehovah's Witness, listen, what I believe, the Bible tells us we can know we're saved. We don't have to wait. We don't have to keep on working and working and working. We can know if we're right with God. And you can talk to Him how and introduce the Gospel that way. Well, that is all that I have that I'm going to look at tonight. Does anybody have something to add to this? A comment, a question about the Jehovah's Witnesses or about the Bible and its teaching on these subjects or anything else. I'm not for sure after a Jehovah's Witness dies, I'm not for sure what a funeral was like for the Jehovah's Witnesses, but they believe that when someone dies... They're asleep. They don't know anything. Like the Bible says, Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise after he died. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that, no, when you die, you're asleep until you're resurrected. So every person that's died is not in, in paradise or in torment right now. They're just simply asleep 
That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. And the Bible, of course, tells us a different picture of that. Uh, the Bible, Paul says to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, is what Paul says. So that's a good question. But I don't know exactly what a funeral would look like. I'm sorry that I don't know that. Anybody else? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Hmm. <laughs> So you've got a letter now. There have been several people in the congregation to get letters. And no doubt Jehovah's Witnesses want to help people, but according to what we've looked at tonight and what appears in their literature, they actually think they have to do that for them to be saved. Um, so, And that's, that's maybe the main reason we started this study is because some of you were getting letters in the mail. So, Anybody else? I do. I do. I do think that I've not heard any word official, but I do think that is why they're sending mail out now is because of the coronavirus and they're not knocking on doors now, so they're sending mail out. I think that's why. 